what I want to talk about today is sustainability, and it's important to geotechnical engineering, but engineering in general, and it's probably not the way you've heard it before. Uh, you've seen my bio, I wrote a book on sustainability and been involved with the World Business Council, I have a couple of board positions, but uh, enough of that. What I want to talk about today is what I think are the three critical engineering issues in sustainability. And uh, I'll start by this one. Uh, sustainability is probably the most important but the most poorly understood issue of the 21st century. Right now we're entering a time when resources are becoming increasingly scarce, climate's becoming increasingly harsh and unpredictable, and this is a result of decade after decade of non-sustainable economic development. Now the experts who do this stuff and do these studies tell us if we don't make radical cuts in our burning of fossil fuels and start to restore these ecosystems and ecosystem services, things are going to get worse and in the not too distant future, some of the predictions are around 2050 that some of these things may become irreversible. Now the problem in all of this, and I'm sure you've observed this, as the public's understanding of these issues are pretty poor, not only in terms of the consequences, but what to do about it. So they've taken a posture of we're going to be nice to the planet, uh, we're going to recycle our paper and soda cans, uh, we're going to buy a Prius, and all things that make them feel warm and fuzzy. Now, unfortunately, the engineers aren't far behind. What I've seen is that in the face of these change, it's still business as usual, and that is that uh, we're out there designing and delivering the same old kinds of services for the built environment as we always did. We don't question whether these kinds of effects are going to have much change in what we do. We're really not moving out of this current paradigm that we're in, and uh, you kind of wonder whether we're ever going to get it. I've been calling it as we do these projects and start adding little features that are green and do more recycling as kind of accessorizing for sustainability. It's another feel-good approach where you can get lead points and uh, add more bicycle racks and do other features like that that uh, make you and the owner feel good but really don't have much effect on what this is all about. Uh, now the next point I want to raise is that I think sustainability is turning geotechnical engineering and other engineering disciplines, for that matter, upside down. So the critical issue now is not how to be more sustainable, really, although that's important, but how to deal with the consequences of non-sustainability. And my point is we're moving into a time of continuous change where the availability of resources and the conditions under which buildings and infrastructure, the things you guys build in the built environment, are not uh, designed the way you hope they'd be designed. They're not operating the way you hope they're going to operate, particularly for long-lived infrastructure. And scientists are now calling this, they got an odd word called non-stationarity, which takes a little head scratching to figure out. But it means that basically the assumptions that you've got in your handbooks and the old project uh, notebooks that you keep around to do the, the next project the values that you've made on these design assumptions are no longer fixed or really stationary. And as these values are changing, they're changing in ways that are not necessarily predictable. And uh, again, this is really important when you're dealing with long-lived projects. Now the third point I want to raise is that this concept or this new world of sustainability or non-sustainability is really creating opportunities that have not been seen in generations or challenges in the same way. So the good news, if you could call it good, is that there's going to be and is now a major change in the way infrastructure needs to be handled. A paradigm shift, I kind of hate to use that word, it's gotten overused as well, but in the way that buildings and infrastructure need to be designed, constructed, and operated in the future. Now this is going to create enormous opportunities and challenges for really all of the engineering disciplines that operate in the built environment. And one of the questions I want to explore in this talk is whether or not the engineering communities are in fact ready for that change. And so if you look at it, my question that I pose to a lot of people, probably ad nauseum for those of you who have listened to me for quite a while, my question to you is, where do you want to be on that project sustainable uh, food chain? And the reason I ask that is that uh, 
I'm not sure whether the engineering community is ready to make that transition because I've heard from the profession, if you talk to the society level, they say, oh yeah, engineers are leaders, gosh, we're civil engineers, we can lead anything, uh, we're just ready, we're, you know, let us have it. You get down to the practitioner level and I get really a different impression and that is that, oh yeah, we like to think we're leaders, but actually we're really more comfortable sitting in our cubicles, finishing up the last project task, waiting for the next RFP to come in or the equivalent. So I got a sense here is that your comfort zone is really down in that let's deliver these commodity services because you've been doing it a long time. Uh, we've unfortunately have a litigation system that wants to keep you there that any kind of innovation is judged on the basis of whether or not you did it like the last person did it. So we're not in a great environment for this. And so my question now is in face of all these kinds of opportunities plus the serious challenges that we're facing, uh, are you ready to take this leadership role or are you want to be in that comfort zone? So that to me is the, the key question. And uh, one of the things you've got to uh, think about is where do your clients want to be? And so there's another challenge because I think your clients are pretty much in the same boat for a number of reasons. Uh, okay, let me go into the details now. Uh, because simply stated, uh, the problem is that we're using up resources faster than they can be replaced or replenished, and we're damaging ecosystem services faster than they can be restored. Now, these resources and services are essential for doing the kinds of things we're doing, getting resources for our projects, uh, dealing with uh, ecosystem services, using the value that they have uh, to make our jobs easier. And uh, unfortunately, the mismanagement of these uh, services have been uh, really a problem. And these are essential across regions, uh, fairness across the globe. We have a number of uh, underdeveloped and developing countries that want the same resources we do. And of course, the uh, standard discussion is, are we going to have these resources and services across generations? And again, the mismanagement has some serious consequences. Uh, so what are these resources and ecosystem services? Well, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, I don't know if you've heard about the study, but it's done by the UN starting about uh, 10 years ago. They've got a number of publications on this and a bunch of great slides and materials if you're interested, but they divided these services up into a couple of categories. The important ones are provisioning services, which you recognize, uh, the non-renewables like petroleum and minerals and metals, and then the renewables, which are fresh water and fisheries and biochemicals and other things, those are the things that provide materials to you and provide those kinds of uh, resources. The, the regulating services are a little different. It's climate regulation, water purification, stormwater control, natural hazard, things like that. These are the things that buffer the systems that are out there. So if you have a strong storm coming through, you have services, you have uh, blocks, you have ways of handling that that uh, people have been relying on for decades and we've also been tearing them up and re mismanaging them for development purposes and not knowing the difference. Uh, so what's the problem here? Are we managing them wisely? Well, the World Wildlife Fund has put out a measure of ecosystem services it include the non-renewables in this case, but uh, I think you'll get my point. Uh, the result of all of this is we're using up these services as if we had 1.5 planets to work with. What that means is that if you look at the global biocapacity based on the number of planet Earths there are, we have one planet, but we're using it as if we had 1.5 or we have an overshoot of about 0.5 planets. And that's for society-wide across the globe. If you look at what the U.S. is doing, we're operating as if we had five planets to work with, and Europe's about three, so uh, not a lot of help there. You know, if you're trying to grasp this, this is like uh, spending the capital and not the interest on whatever you might own in savings accounts or eating your seed corn. At some point in time, it's going to get tough, and we're starting to see the consequences of that and they're significant and intensifying. Uh, one of the examples I think recently as we've looked for resources is the spill in the Gulf 
where you had the deep water horizon oil spill, uh, this is a consequence of going after petroleum resources in ways that get riskier and riskier as we keep proceeding. But there's also issues like uh, if you look at the upper right side, there's a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a result of having pollutants, uh, all kinds of fertilizers and things running down the uh, waters of the Mississippi drainage and all its tributaries. In the old days, that used to be a couple of thousand acres and it occurred intermittently. Now it's permanent and it's the size of Rhode Island and very few things that are productive are used to live in there. Uh, there's also issues like if you look at the lower slide on the uh, picture on the right, uh, you can probably make out barely the, uh, that's the Mississippi River and barge traffic going through it. Recent droughts have been extreme such that the levels of the water have dropped to make any kind of barge traffic, which is essential to our economy, problematic as they try to navigate their way through the river. And then closer to home here and uh, where I live in the Colorado area, there's area Boulder last year had some storms that were record record breaking and uh, disrupted uh, roads and other infrastructure to a level that's just never been seen before in history. So those are the sorts of things we're facing. Uh, at a different level, uh, people are saying that the climate, we're just starting in this process. And so uh, if you look at this graphic, it's, it's a graph of cl climate change impacts across various levels across the top of uh, de degrees of ambient temperature increase across the globe. So it's a global level average. But uh, they're looking at from zero to five degrees centigrade on that scale. And the swim lines are what's going to happen with food, water, ecosystems, uh, extreme weather events, et cetera. So if you look at uh, pre-industrial at zero, that's kind of datum. And that's before we started emitting greenhouse gases. Right now, we're at about 0.8 C, the best information we have. And we're starting to see some of these problems, like in stresses and water supplies, people losing uh, glaciers that they used to rely on for water, Dam damage to coral reefs, more intense storms, forest fires. We had had our share of that in the West. Uh, and it's happening in other places, and the, the list goes on. What they're hoping to target right now, the Kyoto Protocol, which is probably dead in the water right now, and they're looking to revise it, but uh, they were targeting at about two degrees centigrade, and uh, maybe we can keep it to three. But really, if we do business as usual, we're out to the almost the five degree sea level, and there we're really facing disaster levels. And unless things change, it's going to be that way in, uh, at the end of the century. So now the question is, do we know what's causing these problems? And uh, we do. We've known it for a long time because our approach to economic development was not sustainable. And so there's a picture of Gro Harlan Brundtland, the uh, chair of the Brundtland Commission report that came out with this definition. And most of you who practice in this area know it by heart. It's a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, we've addressed this to some degree at ASCE. Uh, we've got sustainability principles in our canons of ethics. And we've said, you know, it's not just sustainable development. That's what you're doing. It's where do you want to be? And so we've defined an, an end state of what sustainability means and said what sustainable development means in, in getting there. And we've, you know, wordsmithed this definition ad nauseum for the last couple of years. Uh, my work, I still can't seem to get the right definition here. They keep tweaking it. But anyway, we get my drift here. Uh, so we know how to define it. We just kind of don't know what to do about it. And so uh, what the situation is, we, uh, we know maybe what the current situation is, but not definitively, so you can break it down to the project level. Uh, we know what the desired end state is, sort of, but it's not well defined. And it amounts to, in fact, uh, leaving out or turning from non-renewables to renewables uh, and completely replacing them, which is a far off thing. And we don't really understand what the gap is. Uh, and our response still is kind of accessorizing for sustainability, being nice to the planet, or practicing some form of organizational project hygiene. It's sort of like flossing your teeth at a planetary scale. Um, so what's happening? Well, some of the organizations are starting to figure this out. 
when I was with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, I noticed that a lot of the multinationals had just gone off Rio 92 and were getting beat up because of uh, a lot of the problems that Brundtland pointed out were in fact uh, tagged for the in industry. And so they were doing a lot of organizational hygiene. They produce reports and we'd scale each other and how, who did the best report and all this was great. At the same time, some companies figured out, you know, if I put the problems that I'm dealing with through a sustainability lens, I can save money. And so people discovered, duh, that if you reduce your energy costs down, you know, you get money back. And so just simple insulation, simple things that they've been ignoring for decades are now making sense. And some of the more uh, adroit people figured out that this is now becoming a necessity. And so water's getting scarce and expensive, and Coca-Cola down the block figured out that they're not just a, a soft drink manufacturer that puts stuff in uh, water, but actually a water uh, organization that has to get water reliably and uh, economically throughout the world. And they're looking at water as becoming very scarce and expensive in various places that they operate. So they're looking at things like uh, the Business Council put out the global water tool that said, uh, if you have a uh, facility in any part of the world, we can calculate what the stresses are and how these stresses might be increasing. So there's that kind of thinking going on on a global scale. However, progress has been pretty slow as engineers and society kind of try to figure out what the answers ought to be. And really no group uh, has really stepped up to the plate and provided that leadership, hence the opportunity. And one of the reasons is there's been some high resistance to change here by owners and operators of existing systems. And uh, for instance, the fossil fuel-based industries are looking at climate change and looking at this as a major threat because taking appropriate action against climate change means that their $20 trillion in fixed assets become stranded assets in the not too distant future. So there's, you can see it in the literature and if you'll get your science from Fox News, you're probably gonna throw something at me, but I mean, this is the kind of situation we're in. And I pulled this quote from Upton Sinclair back in the turn of the 20th century. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it, which I think is a lot of situation we're in today. Uh, I said sustainability is turning geotechnical engineering upside down. And what's happening here, again, to uh, reiterate, is that the consequences of unsustainable behavior are changing these environmental conditions. And so uh, they're doing it in ways that are not only significant, but not necessarily predictable. And so your basic engineering design assumptions about future environmental conditions may lo no longer be reliable and uh, it now requires a more dynamic approach in how you're gonna manage these projects. And so uh, we've always assumed these things were constant and predictable, and now they're not. And so if you look at the issues in detail, you have resource overuse is changing the cost and availability of these critical resources, and you have ecosystem damage uh, is changing, again, the mean, the variance, and extremes of some of these environmental conditions. And so to, uh, this is the non-stationarity part, uh, I try to popularize a little bit. I said, unlike what Shakespeare said in The Tempest, the past is no longer prologue, especially for projects that are being in the built environment. This is uh, also something, and if you go down to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., they've emblazoned this in stone for whatever that's worth, but I thought it was cute. Okay, uh, so what does this non-stationarity mean? Well, I threw up this self-designed graphic looking at how we've come up with the averages and the means and the variances for these variables we use in design. And if you look to the left, we've uh, had a whole bunch of empirical data from past projects and past performance that sets out the mean, the variance, and what kind of extremes you might expect to deal with. And so uh, we've got the old assumptions, and now we've got these new assumptions based on, again, this new normal that's now taking place with new means, new variances, and uh, new extremes. And so I did a shot at trying to look at this from a geotechnical standpoint 
and said, Gee, if you're dealing with site characterization, you kind of knew what to do. Now you're dealing with changing environmental conditions, perhaps tipping points, uh, slope stability. It's uh, now you're dealing with high intensity storms, droughts, forest fires, changing some of the soil characteristics, some of the uh, problems there, uh, jumping down stormwater flow. Uh, we used to design for the 100-year storm event. Now we have multiple 100-year storm events within decades, so it kind of says that that's probably not a good design criteria anymore, but people are still locked into doing that. And uh, we also have the forest fires, rock falls, large debris, other things that are changing this. Uh, so people have come up with strategies now for starting to do, uh, address this. One of the ones they talk about is resiliency, and that's, I think, has been misused a bit. Uh, it's used to, it stands for, in many cases, overarching, how do we deal with this whole problem? But if you look it up in the dictionary, this is about uh, recovering quickly and efficiently and cost efficiently from uh, an extreme event. And uh, there's other things we need to do, like robustness, which is kind of another word for expanding safety factors. You're now expanding the range of operating conditions that this particular uh, design is, is going to work. There's adaptability, where you're not going to try to design for robustness. It might be too expensive, but you've designed in a way of shifting uh, from one condition to another. And then finally, which is a more systems look and where this thing needs to go, is that people, particularly uh, after Hurricane Sandy, New York City and New York State are looking at this pretty closely, is redundancy where you're trying to put into your design, not just doing it for this project and worrying about it here, but having this be part of a system where you have, if one part fails and you've got backups and ways to deliver the functionality you need without having to go uh, worry about that particular uh, element. Now, start, close here. Finally, I think Sustainability is creating opportunities and challenges that we haven't seen in generations. And uh, for academia, uh, you really have a chance here to build a whole new body of knowledge and create new science and engineering disciplines. I mean, this whole notion of a dynamic environment where things are changing and changing in new directions suggests a whole uh, category of things that really haven't been developed. And over the past weekend, we were talking to some of the people about how, in fact, we would make these changes, what kind of research needs to be done, how do we rebuild this database to make it more dynamic. Uh, for the public and private sector, you want to now truly protect health, safety, and welfare, because if you design something that's supposed to last for 50 years and it only lasts for 20, I suspect you're in deep doo-doo here, uh, you should be, and so doing it right may save taxpayer and shareholder dollars, depending on what side of the fence you're on, and importantly, what I tell people in some of my courses is, look, you take and understand this, you have an opportunity to talk to your bosses and clients at any level in your organization and talk about opportunities and risks that they never even imagined they had. And so that's the opportunity, I think, to raise the bar to get up this sustainable project food chain and make a difference. And uh, change out of this commodity-based consulting that I think a lot of us are in into more value-based. Now, this is going to require a major transformation in how projects are delivered. So in the old way, we're meeting client needs. We were meeting stakeholder expectations, practicing organizational hygiene if you want to get into sustainability. And I suggest practicing uh, saying, hey, stuff happens and getting legal counsel as people get upset that the project that you designed didn't last as long as it did. So the new way now is, is a really a three-part piece which we've embedded into the ASCE Sustainable Project Management course, which is available through the uh, Continuing Education Group. It's meeting owner needs, but also doing a meaningful contribution to sustainable performance and accounting for this change. I think, again, I noted that I thought geoengineers, geotechs had a, a competitive advantage. You've dealt with uncertainty in underground situations for quite a long time. Uh, I got engaged in dealing with observational method back in the has waste days, but it seems to me you've got some methodologies there. You understand change, and so you perhaps have a leg up on the rest of the profession. So the question is, are you up to the challenge? Because I think this is, requires a major transformation in the way you do projects. It's developing and deploying these new standards and methodologies. 
It involves uh, getting and uh, taking the opportunity to lead the way towards these conditions of sustainability and uh, getting away from delivering these commodity services, but rather creating new knowledge and methodologies and ultimately providing the high value that many of you declared that you want to give or do de deliver that nobody quite understands it. So uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll just leave you with that final thought. Thank you.